The Declaration of Concern is a great foundation to build on. When a small group of landscape architects gathered right here in Philadelphia, the world was not such a different place. If anything, the issues have just become more complex, more critical and more widespread. And in this context of contested resources, landscape architects must again step in to do what we can by restoring and re-establishing healthy relationships between humans and their environments. Together, we commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Concern set forth with high expectations and determination by Ian McHarg and his band of colleagues. Years and years ago in 1966, it was all about the American landscape. That was our concern. Things have changed. If there is the age of engineering and then there is the age of architecture, uh, this is the age of landscape architecture. Cities and settlements, environmental degradations and politically driven migrations, soil and water, design thinking and collaborations, these are some of the critical pieces of this century's Declaration of Concern. We have assembled an amazing group of designers, environmentalists, landscape architects from all over the world. And that's why we're here, to get organized and figure out how to make the most of our limited number and uh, make our vital contribution. For the first time in our history, more than half the world's 7.4 billion humans live in urban settlements. We have become the single dominant species shaping the planet, from its surface lands and waters to its climate, and by extension to the future of all other species on Earth. The Anthropocene age is, of course, upon us, and we, humans, are its defining species. Five million people a month are moving to cities looking for a better life, five million a month. There's a sort of constant cheerleading for urbanization, for the building of settlement, for the building of cities, for people moving to cities. These physical constructions are not being executed for the social, really for the social good and the cultural good. We are nearing the point of no return when it comes to reversing or even mitigating the adverse effects of climate change. Not all people are being affected evenly. It's really the poorest and often minority populations and those that have the least resources to bounce back from major events that are the ones that are first to be impacted. The crisis tell us, stop, have a new way of dealing with cities, with regions, to cultivate a new way of landscape architecture, a new way of doing planning, new way of doing uh, economics. So we need a revolution. A few of us have the courage to take on the big fights. And McCarg had this. That is an agency that landscape architects need to develop more because the ones who are have the courage and the political skill, I think, to act on our convictions, we become agents of change. Landscape architecture, by dealing with public space, dealing with environmental issues, dealing with public space in the most uh, poorest areas, I think it's a, it's a social equalizer, and also it's a degree of environmental justice. The whole light rail system in Raleigh and, and, and Durham was changed because a group of us read the topo map and the engineers had created a disaster. They had created what was the Great Wall of Durham to separate the white neighborhood and the black neighborhood. And nobody knew it. The city council didn't know it. Mayor Bell didn't know it. And we drew one drawing that showed the topo and it became we do not want the Great Wall of Durham. That's a source of, of agency. 
as a landscape architect, we need to find creative solutions, symbiotic solutions, uh, integrative, comprehensive solutions. So it's an art, right? It's not just uh, engineering. It's just not just not just science. Not just uh, technology. We are artists. We are creators. I think we need to lead with design first. I think as a design profession, we have an obligation to push a very strong and central cultural agenda. At the end of the day, I think in order to get at some of the issues uh, that we heard about yesterday, we really need to do it by moving people's hearts, by triggering their imagination, and by stimulating their minds. Well, to quote Claude Levi Strauss, who wrote, he said something in 1938, the year I was born, he said, cities are not an architectural problem, they're a cultural landscape. Well, I realized this, I too then had realized that cities are also landscapes. They're just urban ones. They're not rural, they're not wilderness landscapes, they're not suburban landscapes, they're urban landscapes. And that was a real, ah, uh, cities are landscapes. And that you could add buildings to a landscape, but you couldn't, it didn't work the other way around. They weren't, it was, landscape wasn't a sauce you poured over buildings to make them taste good. You know, it, in, a, in a nested order of things, architecture exists within the larger order in the context of landscape, the way furniture does in a room. On the one hand, a lot of it is very rational and organizational and analytical, and you have to construct arguments, of course, for how something should be planned or organized. Um, and there's a lot of systems to accommodate. Um, so on the one hand, it's quite, you could say, scientific or technical or analytical or objective. But on the other hand, it's really poetic and artistic and uh, sensual. And you're working with a medium that is, um, that's about atmosphere and temperature and mood and season and sound and tactility and um, how people interact and the sort of the joys and pleasures of being outdoors with other people. Learning to work with processes, we also see that uh, landscape, in a way, is, is fluid, uh, in a way asphalt is also still a fluid. It is a sort of cross-section of hundreds, even, maybe even thousands of uh, processes. And working with these processes, uh, well, makes us understand that uh, as landscape architects, we are never the first to draw a line. People do not see things differently, but that they see different things. In a milieu where professional practice and academic practice are becoming increasingly complicit in maintaining design as an applied field, we need to promote design as a field of inquiry. The art world is all over the place. It doesn't speak with a single voice at all. It's multiple voice, it's all sorts of expressions and it's experimental, and it seems to me that we should be just like the art world in terms of all those, that panoply of, 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 of aesthetics in solving these contemporary problems. We need to be developing contemporary aesthetic solutions to the contemporary problems. Despite the impassioned plea of our colleagues 50 years ago, landscape architects have mostly been peripheral to large environmental agendas. The challenge that we're facing uh, are requesting incredible engineering means, incredibly powerful investments, but somehow along the line, the models that we bear in mind, you know, the older design models, don't necessarily apply anymore. Our desire to want to get to a zero carbon emission economy and uh, create a balance with nature is heroic, it's all the right stuff, but uh, the growth and the amount that we've affected the globe has outstripped our ability. So what we need to do is buy time. I believe that we need to build political capital to make change. It is about stimulating thought and forming political will. It's about giving form to community aspirations and using design as an art of negotiation. The kind of political design that people offered us, I think, would help us attract a much more diverse group of people to our profession, and we'd have a richer set of partners 
to try to accomplish this work with? There'd be less resignation uh, as we recognize the urgency? There is $300 billion in current committed projects in over 160 cities across America under consent decree that can be designed by civil engineers and water resource engineers as big gray tunnels, or they can start to look at regenerative infrastructure processes through urban acupuncture and transform the urban core. Not just responding, being, being reactive, but being proactive. Uh, not just waiting for the RFP to come out to respond to, but going out and making opportunities happen by fi finding the funding streams and helping clients put those funding streams together in order to do the project that you want to do. I think one of the most important human rights is, is recreation, open space, and the improvement of life. And the improvement of life and environmental issues like water give equality to people. 20 years ago, if you had asked most, uh, in most developing countries that designers and uh, planners and politicians would focus their effort in retrofitting, improving existing informal settlements, they would have said, it's crazy, informality is illegal, we have to eradicate them. Now, when mm, informality has become a dominant form of urbanization in most developing countries, well, there's been adjustments, adjustments in the legal system, and universities, academics, politicians are engaging in how to improve existing informal settlements. And we have many examples of them. For instance, uh, the city of Medellin, that for many years uh, represented the most, uh, was the most violent city in the planet, became a city of peace, of culture, of economic development, only by operating in a very proactive way, improving the living conditions in the most challenged informal areas. Now we already have many young like, uh, landscape architects. They would like to work with communities and come to read their land read the community, understand the community, because normally, well, I think we are too arrogant. We are professional ones, then, right? So we come here, we give you knowledge. We give design to you. So we creating new tomorrow for you. That's not true. That's, that's not uh, successful at all, because mostly that's not what the local community, what they want. In design school, you're often talked with a blank page. The reality is no blank page exists. But to me, connecting with places that we've already decided are important to us by various markers, by various designations, by various um, expressions of value is really important because almost everywhere that we value has challenges to be vibrant and vital in the future. I'm interested in building publics, not projects. And I'm interested in places where people and citizens are actively involved in making spaces and in resetting ecologies. What is social equity in terms of design? I think it's part of it is empowering and leaving the neighborhood not only with a better plan or a better design uh, than existed before, but with the knowledge, and in that sense, capacity building to move on and, and, and continue. Um, and also to, to say that this is a way to transform practice, because through capacity building with a community, you learn, and so it becomes a co-learning process, and it transforms your own practice. I think the big change that I've seen is that in many countries, including once or twice in the U.S., Landscape architects have now been the leads on urban projects. The most enlightened, best, and actually most effective developers uh, get it. You know, they understand uh, the, the broad scope of landscape architecture and the, the role, uh, the very important primary role that landscape architects can play in, in uh, planning and designing and, 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 uh, and implementing uh, projects that affect the built environment. So, so to write a declaration today, I think, is to, in some ways, not only build on the declaration from 66, but uh, find ways in which we can measure our success. Uh, because it's not enough to uh, just beautify places. 
uh, we have to substantiate it. We have to make landscape pay. We have to make it a political landscape, a social landscape, a multifunctional landscape. And that kind of declaration uh, kind of raises the bar for how we as landscape architects program and design and plan these places in our cities. Design has to be accountable. It has to be a, accountable to everything in the world or it's not sustaining life and making a happy, healthy population. As a profession, we must be more knowledgeable about our own heritage, where we've come from, where we're going. It's not to say that every landscape should be saved or every landscape should be mothballed, but we must design with change and continuity in mind. And in the way that uh, Ian McCarg had, and these are his words, not mine, an ecological view, we must broaden that view to, in, to include cultural and historical and ethnographic and social values. As we move forward, as we think about the next 50 years, being able to communicate the value of what we do, being able to leverage it in collaborative teams with you know, lots of different types of partners um, will get us to a much better place than doing it alone. We need to bring more people into our profession. Uh, we need to diversify our thinking. Okay? Uh, we need to understand kind of the political and cultural nuances of how solutions are applied to different contexts. And if we don't do that, I argue that uh, this profession uh, will become a form of uh, colonialism. If we truly, truly want diversity, we need more than statistics. It, doesn't have, it shouldn't be all talk. If we really want diversity, we need to recognize it. We need to praise it. We need to, you know, lift it up. Landscape architects can specifically address the future challenges we have by broadening their own scope. And by that I mean getting versed in finance and economics. You know, those are the upstream factors that create the projects that most landscape architects work on. I think it's kind of rare to be commissioned to fail or experiment. And those are just two key functions of, of invention. Right now, government and industry don't fund landscape architects to invent solutions that are grand, you know, grand challenges facing humanity. Technology-based landscape innovations at, at all scales and, act, and, and applications just have to accelerate. We also have to do a better job of fostering individual agency, teaching young landscape architects to be their own advocates, to craft their own agendas, and to find their own voices. It would be great if we could somehow organize our, the organs of the profession, you know, the groups that really represent us and all our differentiations, but get us work, working as groups to actually create a constituency where we would be able to organize our voices and give and empower those congressmen, people who are able to actually enact, um, uh, change, allocate money, create laws, get things moving so we can actually effectively deal with climate change at a scale that needs to be dealt with now. Not the question of how much money you invest. The question is that uh, if you don't do it, how much it will cost. The charge is is serious. The charge is urgent, um, and it requires a pretty agile um, capacity with technical work, but also with the imagination and with with design and with art. We don't know where we're heading. Exactly, but we are going to uh, live through fantastic adventures in, with this discipline. The moment is now. In 1966, a group of landscape architects challenged the country to improve the American landscape. Now I challenge you to improve the global landscape. The vision for all of us is to go beyond our borders and join the world to solve global issues related to the environment. Now is a time for action.